We've been in this series of uh, messages of Acts, right? We're going through the book of Acts. The emerging church, uh, explosive growth, uh, the Holy Spirit's unleashed, uh, people's lives are being changed, there's uh, boldness and all these things. And, uh, and, uh, and then we come to a description of the church at the very end of chapter 4 um, that I wish the writer of uh, Acts, uh, Dr. Luke, I wish that he would have uh, just kind of stopped here for a while because uh, it's really nice and I'd like to pause there except that it goes on and then it doesn't get so nice. So uh, towards the very end of, of Acts 4, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Isn't that good? Right? Okay. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone as they had need. It's fabulous. Isn't this great? Fabulous. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. See, that's where I want this to stop. And go, wow, isn't the church a cool place? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, then it goes on. Now, a, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't it yours at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to people, but you've lied to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then uh, his young men came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. Now that's a stewardship sermon, right? <laughs> you know, right there. <laughs> give or die. Or no, in this case, give and die. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Anyway. Uh, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Oh, yeah, that's the price. Peter told her, well, how could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. I know. <laughs> then the young men came in to find her dead and carried her, buried her beside her husband. Then get the great fear seized the whole church. <laughs> no lie. That's okay. Another offering. Yeah, yeah, take another offering. Yeah. Now, yeah, we're taking the offering again. Okay, now I'm going to jump forward a little bit to uh, chapter six because this also has to do with stewardship and uh, and conflict and tension in this in the ch emerging church. In uh, those days, the number of disciples was increasing, and the uh, the Greek Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So, so much for that. We're all sharing, you know, and everybody's getting the needs better. So uh, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on the tables. So choose seven people from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom and we'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God was spread and the number of disciples increased rapidly and a large number of uh, priests even became obedient to the faith. Okay, Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we can uh, follow you and what it means to be uh, your church, your family, um, together with all the things that happen. Help us to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we have this ideal church where everybody's sharing, everybody's on their one heart and one mind, and everybody's getting along great, right? 
And people are so extremely generous and are so grateful that um, some of them periodically are selling land or home or something and giving it and using the money, you know, all these things. There's no compulsion to do that. They're just describing what sometimes happens. And then it talks about Joseph, this Levite uh, from Cyprus who had a piece of land and he sold it and brought it. And then it talks about Ananias and Sapphira. They also have a piece of land and they sell it and then they say, we're going to, we're going to, you know, Joseph got that cool nickname, Barnabas, son of encouragement. Everybody likes that nickname. I got one like, you know, uh, never mind what my nickname was. <laughs> it still haunts me to this day. But, um, but, but, you know, he became Barnabas, son of encouragement. Uh, the one who comes alongside and helps people become strong and, and uh, their lives better. And, um, they wanted that. Who wouldn't? And so they go, well, okay, we'll sell this land and we'll act like we're giving all the money. Maybe we'll keep half of it back and uh, we'll still have the money, but we'll get all the glory. It's kind of a cool idea. And then uh, their lie gets found out and uh, uh, they can't live with that. Now, um, when I first looked at this passage, I thought, you know, you got the really good guy and you've got the scoundrel. And uh, I always thought, what a great contrast that would be, except for one small detail. And this is what Dr. Luke put in that means very little to us, but it meant a lot to them. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom they called Barnabas, right? Levites take a sacred vow to never own property. That is a tenet of their faith and who they are and their identity. They are not to own property. So this was Luke saying, uh, this guy was a scoundrel too. See, And then the thing we need to realize is that the church is made up of people. Isn't that weird? It's made up of people. And everybody's a little different, but we all come in here with different stuff. And we've got issues and we've things we've gone through and, and uh, PTSD things and psychological, emotional, financial. Some of us grew up in families. That says it all, you know. And uh, we bring that with us and, uh, and we've had some experiences. And so we come into the church and we, and we trust Jesus. We say, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. Come into my life, help me, you know, and the Holy Spirit's working in us. But guess what? We're still us, right? So we still bring that with us. Uh, somebody asked me to this morning, I and I took a little cruise up to Alaska a couple weeks ago, and, and, and somebody asked me kindly, so hey, how was that trip up to Alaska? And I said, oh, you know, it was really great and everything, but I found that I was still there. <laughs> Everywhere I went, there I was. <laughs> And I said, you know, they had a brochure and had all these happy, successful, smiling people getting along, you know, having a great time, winning in the casino, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, and I kept holding the brochure up to the mirror and it didn't look like me, <laughs> you know. And so we look at the church and we go, oh, the church and everybody's sharing love with one heart and mind. But then we go, yeah, but we're here. That kind of affects it, you know. Uh, up in Alaska, we stopped at the, the Hubbard Glacier. Uh, that's actually my family's name. My, my mom's side is the Hubbards. But it um, means nothing. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that the ranger who came on the boat and talked through the microphone the entire day, <laughs> uh, just, just pointing out, uh, was that all these ice things that we're seeing going by the boat, you know, look like little floating bobs of ice. Well, now you know, about 90% of their mass is under the water. <clears throat> so we're going through the kind of glacial ice. And that's what it is for us people coming into church. We get the 10% the on the surface. And then we have 90% of us is below the surface. And we wonder why we sometimes, you know, struggle. And it's no different in the early church. That's the important thing. So, so Joseph, the Levite, who took a vow, a sacred vow that he would never own property, well, he had some property. And I like to think that, you know, um, he may have had it 
as a safety net, you know, in case things didn't work out, he'd have this, you know, place, or um, maybe retire to it or something. Uh, and, uh, and he thought, I don't need to have a secret anymore. I don't need to keep a secret from everybody. I can trust God. Why don't I just do the right thing and be the same person that I appear to be on the surface? I took a vow of not going to own property. Let's give it to the ministry, a new emerging church. They can use it, and I'm going to trust God. And that happens all the time, doesn't it? We have our see, we come in, we have our secrets, and we go, you know, Lord, I, I don't need to hide behind that anymore. I don't need to get, it's okay. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be open. And, and as God works in our life, the Holy Spirit works, we become the same person on the inside that we are on the outside. And, and, we, and we grow that way. And we feel free. And I think Barnabas felt free. He became the encourager. He became the one who came alongside and, and vouched for people and used his reputation to help others and cared. And it was a great model for ministry. We'll hear about him as we go through Acts. Then we have the person who had the secret. They could cock their secret and they and they kind of uh, set up this surface below the surface reality. Like that's going to fool God. And, and the thing that I think was so, uh, that killed them was the reality that they were, they were wanting to be acclaimed and recognized and held in high esteem, but they did it with posturing, with, with pretense. And, uh, and they couldn't live with that. Funny thing is, they didn't have to do anything. It didn't matter. That's the funny thing. All of this pretense was not necessary. It wasn't like the church had a tax that everybody's going to sell their house and give it, and we're going to, you know, I'm bad. the pastor's going to drive a Rolls Royce up and down <laughs> 11th Avenue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's not really that. It was. They thought this was going to look really good. At the same time, we'll keep the money and everything will be great. Um, the church cannot survive with deception. That's the problem. <clears throat> How does God work freely through us and make us transparent all the way through if, if we're living a lie? Because part of what God wants to do for us is bring uh, forgiveness and redemption and release us from the burden of the lie. So then we have this problem. Now, one thing I've learned over the years, now this, is, this is a West Ball theory, okay? You don't have to buy it, but it's a leadership principle. And that is that growth leads to change. And change leads to conflict. <clears throat> Always. Uh, wish it weren't so. Uh, you know, uh, over the years, you know, the churches have called me and, and want to talk about things, and they go, you know, what we really want to do is we want to we want to grow. We want to stay the same. We just would like to grow bigger with more of, of, of us and what we have and what we do the way we like it. We don't really want people who are different to come in because that might change us. But can you help us? <laughs> no! <laughs> of course I can't help you. <laughs> because if you're going to grow, then you're going to change. And if you're going to change, you're going to have conflict. And then you have to deal with conflict. Um... People used to say, oh, I don't believe the Bible because it was just made by the church to make the church look good. Well, that show this passage. <laughs> say, oh, man, this does not make the church look good. Uh, okay, so we've got the Greek-speaking widows. We've got the Hebrew-speaking widows in the church, and everybody's sharing except that the complaint comes out because the Greek-speaking widows are getting cheated out of the food distribution. And there's some scam going on in the other, the Hebrew, now, which makes sense because the church was originally pretty much all Hebrew, Jesus was Jewish, you know, and all those things. And so they were entitled to more, but then the new people are kind of outsiders. They're a little more second class, and so they're not getting treated the same. And the complaint comes to the, to the uh, key apostles, and what are they, they, will you fix this? 
Grandma's not getting her food. That's, that's important, right? Fix this. One of the greatest leadership moments in the history of the church is right here. And you know what the apostles said? No, we're not going to fix this. You're not going to do anything about this? We're going to do something about it. We're not going to fix it. Let's get everybody together and talk about this. Well, you don't want to talk about it because it looks like there's going to be some racism and ethnicity issues and uh, cheating and uh, power issues and all these things going on. Why would you want to get everybody involved in that? Wouldn't it be better to make a secret out of it? Um, no, let's get everybody together. Let's talk about it. What are we going to do? And the apostles said, we don't want to spend our time, every time there's a power struggle or something, we don't want to drop everything and do that. So why don't we pick some people who are filled with the Spirit, they're good people, they're highly respected, and let them take us on. That's the, the delegation principle, right? They, have the, they can do this. Now, I mean, there's all kinds of principles for the church in this, of how, how this could work. Did you find it interesting that uh, the writer, Luke, uh, what he says here when he, when he writes about this, um, starts reading the name, writing the names of the seven? Do any of you care? Do any of you care about that? Nicanor, Hyman, Parmenas, Nicholas, Roman. Does that matter to you? It mattered to them. You know why? All of them were Greek. Isn't that weird? Okay, we have a problem. We have injustice. We have probably prejudice. We have uh, some scamming thing going on. Let's have people who relate to the ones who are the victims of the injustice and let's have them solve it. That is so not the way churches do it now. Now we want to have fair, equal representation of all sides. We want the scammers and the scammed represented at the table. You know, uh, apparently said, no. Wait, these are good people filled with the Holy Spirit. We trust them. They all happen to be Greek. Let's put them in charge of this. Guess what? I know this will shock you. There were no more complaints about the Greek widows not being fed. <laughs> That was taken care of. <laughs> that was taken care of. Brilliant. You know? I, that whole idea of we're going to build a wall between them and we're going to have two different dinners. You know, that didn't happen. Uh, well, the great people build the wall and then they'll not get the food. But, um, that was a little side comment. But, um, so, uh, they actually did something very, very significant and profound. They expanded the ministry. They empowered the ones who were the victims of the injustice. And they did something that is very rare these days. They fixed the problem instead of trying to fix the people. You get that? That's really important. Because they went, okay, if this is a problem, let's, let's solve it. They didn't say, well, who's been cheating the Greek widows? Let's get those people in here. Who's been, you know, taking care of grandma but leaving out somebody else's grandma? Let's bring them in and we'll have a little discipline time and we'll investigate. None of that. Is there a problem? Fix it. As far as we know, the people who had set up the unjust system were never called to account for it. It just stopped being a problem. And I think, how many times in the church do we get off because we, we, we're not satisfied with, with resolving a problem. Instead, we want to try and fix people. We want to change the people. We want to, and you know what? That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's not our job. God fixes the people. 
God changes their heart. God changes the way they are. God makes Joseph the lion cheating Levite into Barnabas, the son of encouragement. You know, that's God's job. What we do is, is work on the injustice, the unfairness, solve the problem, take care of who we need to take care of. That would really simplify life, wouldn't it, if we actually took this seriously? Because I found, you know, as a pastor, all, almost, almost all of my problems in the church over the last, I don't know, decades involve people. Is that weird? It's always been uh, somebody or some group of people or something like that. And, and I, ignoring the scripture, <laughs> forgetting that the Holy Spirit's in charge and saying, well, God... God is not doing anything here. I better get in there and work on these people. I better change them. I better, you know, tweak them according to my plan. Wow. How effective is that? Yeah, not so much. I know that's a wild guess there, David. <laughs> not so much. Not so effective. And uh, But think about how free it would be if we went, Lord, they're in your hands. You... Change them or take them home. You know, whatever you want to do. But let's work on the problem. Let's resolve the problem. I think God wants to do something significant in us. And running around trying to fix people is not going to be significant. <clears throat> what is going to be significant, though, is what Joseph, the, the lying, deceptive Levite, became, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Think of it if the church became more like Barnabas, released from the need to keep the secrets, free to be authentic, forgiven and empowered by the Spirit, following Jesus, free to come alongside people and help them become stronger. Not fixing them. See, that's the funny thing. We're not, we're not trying to fix the people. We're just helping them to become stronger as, as, so, that, uh, so that they're free for what God wants them. What if we became the Church of the Barnabases? Wouldn't that be cool? I don't know if that would fit on the sign or if it would mean anything to anybody. But... Um, the church of encouragers coming alongside, encouraging, realizing that we got 90% below the surface and we're all a little bit different and none of us came in here without a bunch of baggage, right? Okay. And God's dealing with that. So we'll fix the problems and we'll encourage the people. That group of seven, the Greek guys, and you notice there were no complaints from the Hebrews. Nobody said, well, they're going to be unfair to us. <laughs> I guess it was fair. But those Greek guys, it was the first time that the word um, diaklonia was used. The, the deacon. Uh, which literally meant those who serve at the table. So who's in charge of the fair distribution of the food? Those who serve at the table. The diaklonia. We could be a church of serving, encouraging, helping people to become strong, releasing them. And we can do it in a way that we don't have to keep our secrets. Wouldn't that be cool? Let them go. We'd be free. We'd be fixing problems when they came along. We'd be trusting God for the other people and for ourselves to be transformed as needed. And we would be coming alongside to help people be stronger. I'll give you another Greek lesson real quick here. The, the Barnabas in the Greek, it's like the Paracle, Paraclesius. Something like that. that was the Greek word for Barnabas, son of encouragement. 
paraclesis. Jesus said that uh, the Comforter will come. That God's going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, into our life. And he was called the paraclete. Same word. The one who comes alongside us and makes us strong. Basically, all Barnabas was doing was facilitating the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. What God wants to do in us anyway. He doesn't want us holding back. He doesn't want us reserved. He doesn't want us cowering in fear that we're going to be found out. He doesn't want us to be worried about, oh, what secret have we got that the phone's going to ring and wreck our life? Uh, any of that. He wants us to live free. Stronger, bolder, more confident because of him. And that's what we can do with each other. I have no idea what problems we're going to face or, or if we'll ever have problems. You know, this is Harvard Church. We never have problems. We never have disagreements. We never have issues. Uh, we never, we've never had anybody mad at me. So, you know, shoot, <laughs> dodge that bullet like Matrix. But, um, you know, should anything arise, we could be free. Isn't that funny? Whatever happened, we're going through this thing, you know, where we're going to have to leave this place. The bulldozers are going to come. We're going to move somewhere else. Where we don't know yet. And all those things. Tensions may emerge. Misunderstandings can happen. We can fix them. And not fix the people. Not try and change the people. Just fix the problems and love and encourage the people. I'm willing to try that at this advanced age, I think. <laughs> Time to start, you know. I'll make a commitment to you to stop fixing people and, uh, and be an encourager. And I, and I invite you to join me as we do this. And uh, let's try living in freedom with all the spirit. Would that be all right? Even if it's not all right, I'm still going to do this. So, you know, so get used to it. <laughs> all right, well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we welcome you. We thank you for your presence and that you don't leave us alone. We thank you that you have a far bigger dream for us than we have for ourselves and, and help us to trust you. And uh, we pray, Lord, for you to be unleashed in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. And uh, give us the courage to, to live free, to live true, and, and to live as encouragers with each other. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.